it's a real pleasure to welcome Kobe Dennis to Brown University, and it's a real pleasure to welcome such a large crowd. Those of you who come to a lot of our uh, events know we're usually in a small seminar room, but here we are filling the auditorium. And a testimony to Kobe's pulling power, he, uh, as many of you know, he travels around the country, really dealing with one of the hot issues of the day, how communities can work with police to make for new and innovative policing, policing uh, without the cameras, as he's going to talk about today. Kobe's got a long list, and I'm not going to go on and on and embarrass you, but a long list of initiatives that are creative ways of getting the community to work together. Many of you already know about them, but his Building Bridges was uh, another initiative to help uh, police and the community work together. He uh, was in, uh, instrumental in, in setting up Project Night Vision, a free after-school program uh, for kids to age 12 to 18. He's brought back midnight basketball, so uh, young people have something to do late, late into the night. Uh, and there's a long list of things he's thought up, uh, he's engineered in the community. So let me not go on, let's turn the spotlight on to him. Kobe, welcome to Brown. Thanks Thank for coming. Oh, I'm live and direct. Huh? <laughs> How you guys doing today? Good. Oh, good. I'm definitely going to pace back and forth. That's not because I'm nervous. I just think, you know, I was like the first case of ADHD. Uh, for sure. We just didn't know about it. Um, welcome and thanks for coming. I'm probably going to take this mic off because I, I'm getting all kind of feedback. It's, it's not good for my. Uh, there we go. Yeah. A little better. Can you guys hear me though? Yeah, yeah. 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 Good. So today we're just going to talk. A little bit about, I don't have much time and I can stay here all day and speak to you guys about this issue because I live it. Um, it's very dear to me because growing up in the, in the city of South Providence, I despise the police. I don't want to say not like, I mean despise. I didn't like it and it wasn't just me, it was hundreds of us. And when I say of us, people from the inner city, we just had no relationship, we had no reason to like the police. Uh, it was just a bad and very, you know, it's a, a very tumultuous relationship, okay? And one of my classmates in the back who happens to be in uniform, uh, nice to see you, Eric, um, can definitely attest to that. We weren't bad kids. It wasn't even that bad of a neighborhood. It was just uh, a tough time for our community and law enforcement. And that we're talking, I'm 45 years old, so we're talking definitely 30 years ago. So it wasn't until about 10 years ago that, you know, I just finally said when I, you know, got into uh, doing all these different things, I, I was doing community work for about, I've been doing community work for about 20 years, but it was actually about 10 years ago that I really said, I need to step a little bit deeper into the mix. I really need to get involved. And how do I do that? How did I get my community? Because now, now, mind you, my community is still not liking the police. All right, and then all these other things that are going on right now, they weren't even close to happening. They wasn't even happening yet. It was just regular relationships, ordinary every day, not being talked to, walking by the police, spit, anything. We're just looking the other way, no waves, none of that was happening at all. So I said, I'm going to be that person. I'm definitely going to step up and do something. I didn't discuss it with anybody. I didn't have a meeting about it. I just thought, you know what, it's about that time. So when I decided to do it, I had to jump in, you know, head first. I just had to go in. I said, so I went to the top. Uh, had just met uh, the colonel of the state police at the time with Brendan Doherty. I had just met him. Didn't know who he was. Sizing him up. When he tells the story, he says the same. We say the same thing because it was definitely real. He sized me up. I sized him up. And if you ever met Brendan Doherty, it was definitely that. <laughs> and, you know, it was in the middle of the housing projects of Chad Brown. I was working with the youth. And, you know, he, you know he, we were talking back and forth about different things going on with police and about the relationships. And, and actually, his wife was standing there at the time, and she just jumped in the conversation and said, oh, why don't you two do something about it? <laughs> like, easy enough. And you know when the wife speaks, that's the end of it. <laughs> uh, and, she, and she said that, and she wasn't smiling at all. And I said, you know what? You're right. We're going to do something about it. So... I'm moving really quickly with these stories, mainly because I don't have a lot of time. But so I started Project Night Vision, and I and the Project Night Vision was a teen program to serve inner city youth after dark. Now, at the time, about 10 years ago, the government pretty much had taken away funding 
for youth over 13. So what does that mean? When kids after school try to go to child care programs, they no longer would be paid for. So here we go with these, all of these inner cities, okay, especially in Rhode Island, no longer could their parents have child care for the 13 or older. Because I was in daycare, they called it, or child care from 13 to like 60. That's the only reason why I wasn't in the streets or selling crack or what have you on the streets because we had to go to these after school programs and things like that. My mom was like, you're going there. And she was able to pay for it through DHS. Okay, I know that's big in the news right now, but definitely we was able to pay for it through that. That has stopped. About 10 years ago, it stopped. The influx and crimes and, 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 and uh, petty crimes, major crimes, crack, all that stuff, all, it skyrocketed. And a lot of people didn't see it from up in the ivory towers, but we saw it and felt it right in the neighborhood. I know, because I lived next door to them. All the kids that used to go to the daycares and the after school programs are now on the corner because there's nowhere to go. They would go to the boys and girls stuff. Now you can't come in. You're not old enough, or your mother doesn't have the money to pay for it. You can't go in. All these centers, all these places to go, there was nowhere to go. So I said, you know, instead of crying about it, I decided to be about it. So I created Project Night Vision, and it was a program that had kids after school, after everyone home. And I always say this because, you know, many times the people that work in Providence, and I'm going to talk about Providence right now because that's my city and that's where I'm from, uh, once they worked in Providence and they would leave, I'd say the rear, the rear view mirror syndrome. They all work in Providence, get a check in Providence, get their pension from Providence, and then they leave at 4.30. And they leave us and the kids in the rearview mirror. So I got tired of that. So I said, I'm, I'm still here, so I got to do something about it. So we created this program, and it was an after school. They stayed, hundreds of kids. I'll fast forward again, five years, 5,000 kids. I've had at least 5,000 kids through my program. We had volunteers from, from Brown University, Johnson & Wales, all the different universities. We had the, the Rhode Island State Police. So back with that, the Rhode Island State Police were like the backbone. That was the backbone of the program. Why did I say that? Because I said, if I want it to do this program to the utmost, I wanted it to start it with the police that we actually formed a relationship with. I didn't know them from the Providence Police at the time. All right? I didn't know them at all. And, and Brenda Doherty and the, and the state police told me all these things, and I didn't believe them either. I said, yeah, whatever. You're going to do a basketball league in the middle of Chad Brown in the summertime, and the troopers are going to play? Yeah, right. Well, that summer, we did a basketball league in the middle of Chad Brown, and the troopers played every day. To this day, if I walk through Chad Brown, people will say, that was the safest summer we ever had. <laughs> Damn sure it was. State troopers playing ball in the middle of the project. <laughs> there was nothing going on in there. <laughs> Believe me, it was great. The kids were outside playing, double the mile, Miss Johnson over there, Miss Jenkins over there, everybody outside. And man, it was great. People would just be outside just sweeping, smiling. I know I don't have to duck no bullets today. This is great. So it was a great thing that I thought would never come to fruition. I said, there's no way they're going to do that. They did it. And it was a lot of time on their own time. So that didn't, you know, it was all lovey-dovey and a lot of pictures and things. That didn't make it sell me. And it definitely didn't sell the community. They were like, yeah, whatever. They're just there, publicity, all that, whatever. They got over that. I don't want to say quickly, but they got over it after time. How did they get over it? Time and time again. People started showing up. And it wasn't just the state police, the Providence police, uh, Cranston police, East Providence police. They were all coming to my program. All the different cities in Rhode Island wanted Project Night Vision in there, Central Falls. I tried it in Woonsocket for a while. The Woonsocket uh, police chief at the time, Chief Carey, he, he definitely endorsed it, and, and they were coming for a while. We did it. We tried. We was going to try it in all the different cities. But what was happening, what I failed to let you guys know, is there was no money involved at all, no grants, no money. I wasn't being paid. It was from 4.30 to about 8.30, 9.30 at night. I have three children, all right, and a wife. And still, it's going, you still owe me from them five years, too. Uh, in the years that, <laughs> even now. So I, I just got tired, and it actually just ended um, last year. So what did I do? I went on to do different things because I couldn't stop. I thought I was going to be home at nights for a while, but that didn't work. So the reason why I'm giving you all this backdrop is not to tell you about myself. 
I'm letting you know the reason why this is titled Community Policing Without Body Cameras. Not because I don't like the idea of body cameras, period. I don't like the idea of body cameras to replace the human interaction or to let, let lead people to believe that that is what's going to help with, with this relationship building. Absolutely not. That's almost like saying the cell phone is helping with the family relationship. How's that working? <laughs> it's not working, okay? The human interaction is the only way we're going to solve this problem that we have right now in this country of policing and community relationships, okay? And one of the problems that I told Ellen that I would admit to today that I'm very guilty of is separating the two, community policing and policing. I'm going to say it on camera, where's it at, over here. <laughs> I, Kobe Dennis, should have never allowed that to happen. And I'm one of the biggest culprits of it. It's going to take me about five more years to back out of that one. Because I shouldn't have said that. Because it's the same thing. Because now what I've done, and I'll say me, yes, some of my partners is here, so I'm going to blame him too. <laughs> you in the back, don't laugh. <laughs> some, of, some of my friends are here as well. Law enforcement friends too. He's not the colonel no more, I'll blame him too. Uh, we took this and said, hey, there's community policing, there's police. No, we should have never did that. It's policing. So what are we doing now? What did we create? We created this gap. We created this divide, one just like we do with the people. All right, we created this divide. Unbeknownst, we, we didn't know what was going to happen, but it happened. So now police departments are able to say, we don't have money for community policing. Uh, yes, you do. It's the same thing as policing. It's the same thing. I like to call it the get out your car policing. And when police officers tell me that they don't have the time to get out their car on occasion, I will look right back at the police officers and say you're a liar. You cannot tell me. No one ship, I don't care, New York, Chicago, L.A., definitely not Rhode Island, can say they don't have the time to pull over once in a while and throw a football. To pull over once in a while and shake a little boy's hand or a little girl's hand. To pull over once in a while and ask somebody their name. If you tell me that, you're calling me a fool. That's what you're doing. It is not that busy. Calls for service are not happening every two seconds. You're talking to the wrong guy. Because in Providence alone, I know the guy that was on the post that had the most calls for service. And he told me personally, I had the most calls for service in Providence for at least the last three years. And personally, he said, Kobe, I'll be very honest with you, I still had an hour or two downtown where I could chill, text, go get a coffee. Sorry, guys, donut. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that we can't do it, it's that we don't want to do it. And then when we start to separate this stuff with community and all that, that's when we get the unions and FOPs and everybody involved that say, you don't have to do that neither. <coughs> well, to me, that's what you signed up for. You see the side of the car in Providence, I don't know if it says it on all of them, but it says protect and serve. I think we need to read that before we get in the car more often. Protect and serve. It doesn't say protect, serve, and observe from a distance, riding by, <laughs> protect and serve. That's exactly what you're supposed to be doing on a daily basis. All the other stuff, the arresting, the beating up, the fighting, all that, that stuff is supposed to be a result of bad behavior, a result of, you know, things going down or whatever, the stuff we see on TV, all that, which most cops tell me they don't really even get into. I don't know how many police officers told me they never used their gun. So I just really resent this whole notion of body cameras are going to save the day. Because when we get, once again, the cameras in the cars, all right, and I know from the state, from hearing from the state police, I know from the Providence police, which <laughs> that never came up in the media, Providence police had cameras too in their cars. I don't know where they're at anymore. I have no idea. I know the state police still use them. Some Providence may still use them. But... The problem with that, which a lot of people aren't talking about, 
maintenance. You know, just like a new phone. How many phones have there been out? What are we on, the 7 and the iPhone? I can't keep up. They're trying to get me to upgrade all the time. I don't even know how to use that one. <laughs> so we're going to keep upgrading these cameras. No, we're not. We're not going to do it. Let's not present this to the people like it's the fix-all, because it's not. All right? And when you're in the inner city and in these communities that these police officers will serve, they will tell you that. How do I know? Because I work with these people every day. All right? I'm not just talking about something I read. I'm not just talking about something I overheard. I'm talking about what I live and breathe every day. Two kids were shot last night, late last night. I missed the call. It was 11.30. Kids were shot at about 11.20. 11.20, 11.15, how do I know? Because I get the call after the, while it's still smoking. I get the call from the community, from whoever. Somebody calls me, for sure. I felt bad last night because I actually missed the call. I was sleeping, which I'm usually not, by 11.30. The two kids got shot the next day, so I get the messages. I reach back out, how's everything going, what's going on? Who did what? Is it gang related? Uh, you know, is it, is it something to be alarmed of? Do I need to call somebody? Is it fine? Are the police, were the police on the scene? Were they there? Were they helpful? I want to know all this. Why do I want to know all this? Because I want to know if what I'm doing and what we're doing in this community is working. And what are the answers that I'm getting? Yes, COVID, police showed up on time. Yes, COVID, it was very helpful. Yes, COVID, they did communicate with us. Yes, why? Because it's working. I don't care what no one says in my community. They're not out there on the front line like me and some of my friends that are here today. It's working. This relationship building is working. I'm telling you right now. And, and it's not from this camera. It's not a divide of uh, what we're going to use with this camera. It's from the phone calls from, from state police officers. It's the phone calls from private. Today alone, is it 12? What is it, 12 and change, 1230? I've talked to at least four police officers today. All right. State, Providence, Cranston. Already, just about different things. Oh, Central Falls. We have a Central Falls, uh, Central Falls forum, community forums that we have all the time. We're having a community forum in Central Falls in December. So they're already calling me about that, because I'll host that. But you guys are all welcome to as well. Because this is not new. This is not something that Brown has just said, hey, let's talk about this, because the topic's hot. I've been here before talking about this. I've been all over the state talking about this. And I've also been, you know, in different parts of the country talking about this. Because what we're doing is working. So that's what I said. I'll go back to the fact that I, I, I do not like the idea of body cameras being presented as they are. Because they're being presented. Don't get me wrong. I'm not totally against the technology and moving forward into the future. I get all that. Let's not present it the way it's being presented. Also, let's not introduce it to the people as a save all, especially when you didn't talk to the people. I know they didn't talk to people because they didn't talk to me. They didn't talk to me, the person that's right in the mix of everything, in the community, in the inner cities, all the gangs, all the kids in the streets, all the things that are going on, who's got what, who's selling what, so on and so forth. I have the youth telling me, and then I have the adults telling me, and then in between we have those 20-somethings that are all in the mix doing most, uh, causing most of the havoc. I don't want to just say it's that group, but it's pretty much that group. The ones that don't have anything to do, which is why we reinvigorated the Midnight League, who was also, which my classmate was actually on my team <laughs> for the Midnight League, um, which we had 500 to 600, 20 something, 30 somethings, 40 somethings playing basketball at night with law enforcement. Let's think about that. All over the state, from here to South County, why isn't that money, 250 grand, going towards the Midnight League? Hmm. It makes you wonder. Why do we keep creating all these task force and all these different things? We had a gang problem. In Providence. I'll go back to Providence. We had a gang problem in Providence about 10 years ago. It was little gangs. I don't even call, it, call them gangs because I'm telling you, I really don't call them gangs because I know all the kids. They're not gangs. All right? They're not organized. Well, I guess there's different types of gangs. 
You know, in sociology, I studied that as well. This would be called a scavenger gang. And why do you call it a scavenger gang? Because scavenger gangs are a bunch of kids that get together and really don't have a plan. They're not having meetings. They're not talking about finances. They don't have a president. They don't have a, they barely have a leader. So they're scavenger gangs, a bunch of kids from the same side of town that grew up together, same struggles. Parents went to school together with us, by the way. And they get together and they just smoke, drink, or whatever, and cause havoc. So we had a problem with that big time, probably about 10 years ago. So what did they create? They created uh, you know, the gang task force unit. To me, this is, this is indicative of what keeps happening. And I'm just saying Providence right now, because that's where I live. I'm not picking on them, and I'm sure when this comes out, it'll look like I'm picking on them. And I don't care if it looks like that. Because I live the reality of what they're saying it looks like. I'm there. So my point in saying that is, well, why didn't we maybe invest some of that money to get a whole task force, outfit it out, new guns, new everything, you know? Or why wouldn't we go and do the, the uh, proactive measure and try to finance one of these Pop Warner Leagues or so on and so forth? And by the way, the Pop Warner Leagues, which have kids from 12 to about 17, well, excuse me, 12, 6, Five or six to about 17 are all underfunded. And I'm just talking Providence. And when I say underfunded, jerseys tatted, hel wrong helmets, no numbers on them. The fields are a mess. The fields look like someone's backyard with puddles, patches, everything. No nothing. All volunteer coaches, so on and so forth. These kids are with these. They must be, and this is no exaggeration, about nine teams, and they all have about nine organizations. They all have about 500 kids if not more, and all volunteers. I just don't, I can't understand why we wouldn't go to these coaches and say, hey, you don't have to give them the money if that's the problem. Why don't we finance these leagues? If you're going to keep, you're going to tell me you're going to keep these kids from August to November busy, on the field, tight. By the time they get out of practice, 8 o'clock at night, where are they going? Home, to bed. They're going to eat and they're going to sleep. So now, there we go. We got... August to November. Then we got other things going on in the city from, excuse me, then we could have other things going on in the city from November to, to uh, February, March. And then March, April, here comes the Midnight League all the way to August again. That seems like an easier fix to me than to keep creating these little pockets of joy, of hope, of promise that to us on the ground are not working. Now, if you go to another meeting or talk to somebody else, oh, they're going to show you some numbers that say they're working. Come to the hood. Ask them if it's working. Ask the family I talked to last night of the little boy that got shot in the head. It was reported that he got shot in the head. Actually, after talking to the family, he got shot in the head and the neck. And the 15-year-old girl who got shot in the stomach. Ask their parents, if these task force are working, ask them where would they like the money to go. And right there, by the way, this is up the street, by the way. It's on the east side uh, of Providence. Not to scare the students or anything. Sorry, guys. But it's literally five minutes up the street where this occurred. We cannot continue to think that there's easy fixes for this. It's not. As I told you, I rewind the 10 years, it's taken that long to build the trust with the state police, to build the trust with the Providence police. Oh, don't get me wrong, it's, it's a, you know, Providence police and I, I call the relationship between the Providence police and myself, it's like a marriage. You know, one week we're mad at each other, next week we're not. Sometimes we want to hang out with each other, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we call each other, many times we don't. But guess what, I still, and one of their biggest allies in the city. Ask anyone. Ask anyone. I will not denounce their presence. I will not talk about law enforcement in a disrespectful way. I just talk the facts. And a lot of times, it's not what people want to hear. All right? I'm, not on the, I'm in this for the long haul. But many times, people have said, oh, he's going for a job. I can't wait till that job comes. I, I'm waiting for it. He's going for a job where he gets paid 
I have never received a dime from any law enforcement agency, ever. In fact, they owe me a few lunches. <laughs> so it, it's very easy from the outside looking in for, for the people to say that the police aren't doing the right thing. Very easy. It's very easy for the police to say the same about people like myself. But without these conduits, without these liaisons like myself and some of my coworkers that are here, I call them coworkers, like we actually have a job. We, <laughs> we just do this. <laughs> we do this because we care. We do this uh, because we know it's necessary. If it wasn't for those relationships, I can guarantee you what you see on TV would be happening here. I guarantee that. Because it's a daily grind. It's a daily grind that we have to stand up for. The video, I probably get more, my phone is just full of videos. Cop, cop videos. Uh, videos of what's happening all around the country. And I have to stay abreast and on top of all that stuff. Why? Because I got to look at it. I got to read about it. I got to talk about it. I got to uh, call people. I got to you know, see what's happening. Sometimes I receive calls from that place. Um, I have to actually look into it and take time. All I have to excuse myself on my phone all the time because I'm always working on that. Why? So I have the ammunition to be able to speak intelligently about those different cases. And we didn't save all, um, we didn't save all the things from happening, but I'm definitely going to take credit, and I will, I don't mind. I'll take credit for a lot of the things that didn't occur, for sure. You know, we had the highway fiasco. I can assure you that it wasn't none of the people that I work with. And I'm not knocking the people that were on the highway because I know why they, they I know what they thought they were doing and I know why they did it because I knew half of the people that were there, but it's just not part of the movement that I'm, I'm doing. And that's what happens a lot as well. Just like police officers get all lumped into one, so does the community. As soon as somebody sees me, what's the first thing? Oh, you must be in Black Lives Matter. I'm like, if that means I'm black and I believe my life matters, yeah, I'm with them. <laughs> Other than that, I'm not a card-carrying member. I don't have a T-shirt or a hoodie, and I don't have to hashtag it all the time to show that my life is important. And once again, I'm not knocking Black Lives Matter. They have a purpose. They do, you know, that's, they're doing what they believe is right at the time. All right? And I still think, just like with myself and the retired colonel here, have, when we traveled and, and, and talked about this work, the police departments, which I, I wish they would say it more often, are, uh, are forming bonds with the Black Lives Matter movement because they want to find out what, what it is they need to do better, what it is they need to do to change you know, this culture. Because fighting it is not working. It shouldn't work anyway because these are, this is a group of people, and now it's hundreds of thousands of people that are trying to be heard and get their point across. And the last time I checked, law enforcement works for the people. So I, I just can't get that when I think about you going against a group of people that you work for. That doesn't happen. No one in here tells their boss what to do. You can, you can if you want to. You'll be fired. So how is it that that happens? That's the stuff that we're trying to get across to law enforcement. It is the law enforcement officer's job to find out what the community wants and why are they reacting the way they are and why are they talking the way they are and why are we so mad and angry. It is your job. And once you sign up for that, yes, that's your job in harm's way. When I was in the military, I used to whine all the time when I went to war, all the time about, man, are we going to get extra pay for this? We're at war. Do I get an extra check? And they would tell me, the old salty guys that have been 20, 30 years, they're like, son, this is all part of just being American. It's all part of being a United States military man. And I bet you somewhere down the line, that's getting lost in translation with some of the law enforcement officers. This is my belief right now with some of these young officers. This is your job to try 
and mend these relationships. It's your job to try to talk to the citizens that you serve, that you swore to serve. Even though they're imperfect and not right and irrational and crazy at times, it's still your job. You signed up for it. Last time I checked, there's no draft to become a police officer. Okay? So a lot of times, this is where I get myself in trouble on social media. When the, my police officer friends, and believe me, believe it or not, I have hundreds. And we're on our social media, and we're going back and forth. And they're like, oh, we do this, and this is our job. It's so dangerous and all this. And I'm like, plain and simple, bro, you signed up for it. Okay? You signed up to, sh to be at this level, even when some of the people are down here. All right? And trying to get that across to young police officers in particular and to the people is a difficult job. Because it's not fair all the time. Absolutely not. So back to the cameras. What is that going to solve in our community? And I'll bring it back right back to Providence. Because I'd like to definitely talk about what we're in our city. Or I can, you know, go state at the most. But I don't like to talk about the other states when it comes to the cameras because that's what they're saying right now. All the numbers are showing that the cameras have proven results and all that. I, I don't want to say that the statistics are, are wrong, uh, but I'm going to say here in Rhode Island, I just think that what we're doing is working. And as long as we can continue to build the relationships, as long as we can continue to have forums like this, because this is what's needed. A lot of you, this is your, probably your first time even coming to something like this. Um, and I hope not your last time. Conversation is needed, because this is an uncomfortable conversation. I didn't want to stand up here and say everything that was forthright and everything that everyone's going to believe and everything that you read in the paper. I purposely didn't do that. You may not believe everything I'm saying, and you don't have to. But anytime you want to follow me for the day, <coughs> speaking of following, I talked to Tim White yesterday. Anytime you want to follow me for the day, or anytime you'd like to be involved in any of this, you are welcome, because that's what we need. Whether it's law enforcement, whether it's student, faculty member, neighbor, someone just visiting, we need you out there to continue this message. And it's not an easy task. It's not something that's, you know, open, you know, your opinion and what you say is, is the law and so on and so forth. It sometimes gets messy. But as long, it's been nonviolent for as long as I can remember. I don't think we've had a violent protest. I said the closest to a violent protest was what I brought up already, the highway situation. And that's what happens to me when a bunch of groups come together um, that have different causes. And that's what happened in our instance. I don't really want to get into that, but... There was definitely four or five groups there. And, and unbeknownst to uh, three out of the five groups, they had no idea that what was going to happen. It just happened. So I don't know what my time's looking like, but I really would rather have a dialogue. Yeah, 20 minutes, so it's a good time to turn to questions. For questions, want. sorry to ramble on. I can no, actually go on for days talking about this subject, but I'd rather take questions concerns, comments uh, from the audience. We're starting it off. Cool. You want I'll, I'll ask you a question. Sure. Can you explain to them what happened to you in Mackinac City so they can get a perspective on nationally and what we're seeing in Rhode Island compared to other parts of the country? Sure. Can you introduce yourself, please? Um, I'm Steve Oldon. I'm the retired superintendent two weeks ago from the state police. And I partnered with Kobe, and he took me to Mackinac City. It's a totally different story he could tell you behind the scenes. But what really happened there, I think he needs to tell you. So in Mackinac City, we're there with the chiefs of police from uh, L.A. I mean, these guys are all, you know, the, the guys that are on TV probably every day. Uh, L.A., Chicago, New York, and all these different places. And, you know, they're just talking about, you know, different areas of their cities and stuff that, you know, myself and, and the retired colonel were just looking like, man, like some of the guys were saying, like, there's certain parts of different in L.A. and stuff like the police can't go. Like, we can't, you can't fathom that. Like, no, the police are not allowed in there in certain parts. That's how bad it can get. 
All right, so these guys are telling stories. Now, they chose us to be on the panel, and I think when they chose us to be on the panel, they're thinking, all right, Rhode Island, you know, they, what, what can they be doing there? When we're looking at the grand scheme of things, these places, I'm telling you right now, they're, they're looking at us as, oh, this small state. I'm sure they're saying everyone's, you know, which, which most of my family members believe that live out of state, everyone's white and everyone's rich. In case you didn't know that, that's what a lot of people think about Rhode Island. So, um, but we get up there, and, uh, and I'm up speaking. I'm one of the only civilians there, actually. It's all every, police from all over, FBI, BEA, it's all types of sheriffs. Everyone's there. And I, and I start to tell them the things that we're doing in the room, a couple hundred people, definitely 250 or so, silent. They couldn't believe that we were able to forge all these. First of all, they didn't know all that was going on in Rhode Island. Second of all, they couldn't believe the relationships we were able to forge over the last five to seven years and how we did it, how we did it with proactive measures, how it's really working, how we have police standing next to, you know, uh, the, the average guy on the street or even the average, you know, even a drug dealer or an ex-drug dealer or, or one of the ex-shooters or what have you in the neighborhood shaking hands and, and talking to state police officers, talking to Providence, talking to Cranston. There's, at any time, any program that I'm in, there will be police coming in and out all the time. And you'll see these guys dapping these kids up, all that. That doesn't happen all over the place. So they were in awe how that happened. And I'm telling them how it happened little by little. And it was just a question and answer session that went on probably for about 30 to 40 minutes with all these people asking questions. And I, that's how I started a lot of my connections around the country with these people that I'm still in touch with. So when tragedies are happening in their cities, which they are, I'm still in contact with some of them that are emailing me saying, well, what was you saying about that initiative? And what about the barbershop initiative that, you know, uh, that I actually got from someone from St. Louis? And, uh, and that, by the way, the barbershop initiative hasn't come out yet, but we, we have a barbershop initiative that's coming down the pipeline uh, very soon that involves law enforcement, uh, health, and um, education. Um, so, yes, that experience uh, in Mackinac City was amazing. And I know that when I came back from that trip, I was able to say, you know what, what we're doing is working, it's right. I, it felt right all along, but I, I knew it was validation, definitely. Before the next question, we've got a couple of microphones, and we want to capture the question as well as the conversation. So raise your hand, and uh, Melissa or Ellen will, uh, will come in. Yes, I think she has a mic already. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you had a question. Go ahead. Hi there, my name is Emmy, current uh, senior at Brown. So my question to you is, you speak about proactive measures yep. that you're uh, taking um, to do community policing, which, which I think is great, and I really love the human interaction part of it. But I'm curious to know, what are some of the measures that you and the people involved in the collaboration have taken to, um, on, on the police side, in terms of, are there diversity trainings that you guys do with police officers or discussions of why it is that certain communities are in the state that they are? Absolutely. Like I, as I told you, I could go on probably for another three hours with, with th this. That's just that's definitely one of the components. I am scheduled to speak at the Municipal Academy that will be coming up. Um, I've spoken at plenty of others. And when we have these community forums, what we do is bring all the new recruits. Because what I'm really trying to do is change the mindset of the new police officers coming on. Trying to battle with the, the older ones, no offense, the guys that are already on force, they're going to believe what they want to believe already. I can try until I'm blue in the face to change their mindset. It's probably not going to happen. So what we're doing is getting the new recruits to come in, hundreds of them. I've seen hundreds of them. Actually, one pulled over on the street the other day. I was like, hey, I remember you from, I'm like, I hope you remember what I was saying. So, um, so we talk to them. We let the community, they meet the community. So it's the recruits, the community, and we let the community just ask them questions. You know, things like, so you see a kid walking down the street, hat back with sagging, button is there, whatever. What are you going to do? Like, how are you going to talk to this kid? Like, you know, are you going to just stereotype and say he's the, what are you going to do? And the recruits are able to answer. So that's one of the things we've been doing. Uh, diversity training, we've been pushing for diversity training. I know the state police have it and other municipal uh, police departments have it, but that's definitely one of the things we're pushing. Um, just meetings. People will call me and ask, hey, can we meet with the chief of police? Absolutely. Anywhere. It could be any chief. Uh, my son was just stopped uh, in South County uh, last week, and they don't know he's my son. They have different last names, and he didn't. He never says, "Oh, Kobe's my dad." He never does that. He knows better, and sure enough, they gave him the break of his life. 
He, he, he bought a new car. You know, they think they know everything. He's in his second year at URI, thinks he knows everything. He bought a, a new car. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to drive it uh, to the location and, you know, and no registration, nothing. He gets stopped by the South County Police. L long story short, they escorted him to the campus, gave him a lashing, tongue lashing, which they could have, he could have went to jail, literally, no nothing. I mean, he's just like driving a stolen car, pretty much. Gave him a lashing and said, don't drive it anymore. And then he had to hear from me. So what I did is call, reach out to the chief of police. Thank you, guys. Tell them that's what I'm taught. That's discretion. And not that it was my son. I get stories all the time, and I'll call them or give them the number to the chief or what have you. But that's the stuff that we have to do to call it, create this change. That's what we need, some understanding. That right there, to me, was good policing. Why? Because they know he's just a dumb kid, all right? And I'll call him that because he's my son. Um, that made a, a goofy mistake. And yes, if he would have had to pay for it, that's fine. I'm not saying look the other way. But in that instance, that police officer at that time took this black kid for what he was, just a student that made a dumb decision and wasn't trying to do anything bad. And he was going to class. And they, the cop followed him there and everything. So stories like that, and I will share that on social media. Just like I shared some of the bad ones, I'll share the good ones too. So yes, we're doing a lot of work. learned a lot from listening to you. Thank and you. Uh, uh, one question, uh, partway through your talk, uh, you made a comment that uh, intrigued me. You said that you're still waiting for the job to come out of it. <laughs> um, I, I had assumed up until that point that your services, the work that you do, is somehow or other compensated by uh, our community's programs. Uh, is this uh, you, you must be getting some something to compensate you so that you can feed your family and house and clothe yourselves. Uh, is it too um, much to ask to say, do you have a day job? Or? Uh, no, that's, 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 that's all right. <laughs> my, wife, my, my wife asks me that David sometimes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, David, I'm David London. I'm, I'm a, an alumnus uh, of Brown. And, How are you doing, Dave? Uh, hey? I'm a volunteer on Oh, we in my retirement. Well, thank you for your service. Thank uh, you for volunteering. I'm very interested in, in this issue. And uh, so I, I, I'd just like to know, I, I know people uh, who give of themselves often do so because they're fortunate enough to have the resources <laughs> not to have to work. Oh, I wish that was the case there. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure, uh, Whoa. Is, is the community, I, I, <laughs> are, you, are you in some way being? Uh, uh, let me jump in there and answer, because I'm over here shaking because over here trying to answer this you question. Can't, you can't buy people. Yeah, that, know what you do. I think that's part of that's part of the allure. Uh, that's definitely part of uh, the belief and why so many people believe in me. And my friends always tell me, and one of them sitting right here, he's like, "Kobe, you, you don't have to be poor to talk to the people that don't have money. You don't have to be so poor and not have money to relate to them." He's still trying to convince me of that. Uh, and, and I just can't see that. And my wife wishes I would listen to him, but I don't. So no, I get no funding from this, zero dollars. I have a small job that I work, probably about 38 hours a week. And the, I have every job that I've taken in the last 10 years, and luckily because of you know, my relationships with people in the city and things like that, the jobs that I've taken working with young people, they don't, as you know, if you work with young people, you really don't make any money. The one thing I've asked them is, that I can have the freedom to do this. And that's it, because I think it all connects. I'm working with these young people. When I'm there, like tonight, I'll work with the young people till 8 o'clock at night. Uh, and when I'm talking to them, I'm kind of almost interviewing them sometimes. How you feeling? How was your day? Is it all right? When you walked in, you know, and it's not like prompting. It's just, what happened? And, and, you know, sometimes we'll have roundtable discussions. What do you do when you stop by the police? I'm changing the mindset. And I have guest speakers come in. The colonel can tell you. Uh, quickly, please, Colonel, tell them the one story when you came to speak when you were acting Colonel to what the group that I'm with right now, and you asked them what did they think about the police. Yeah. Um, again, thank you. Uh, Steve O'Donnell, it's Princeton Kings, about 30 young men, that the 13 to 19 year old age group. 
and all of them but one had negative interactions with law enforcement. A um, little taken back by it as a career police officer, uh, been in the business 33 years, and none of it was hostile. It was more they watched it on social media. Two of them had personal interactions with the police. The rest was learned through television, social media, family. But it was real. It didn't matter if it was per their personal or not. So in the first five minutes, they were very um, distant from me in the last hour because I came from the same place they came from. When I finally convinced them that I grew up the same way they did, there was a buy-in after an hour. And then they came back. They came to state police graduation um, a month or two ago. We recognized them. And maybe some of them, a couple of them said, that's what I want to do for a living. Mm -hmm. So I think what Kobe tells people is it's the opportunity. I don't want it because I look like Kobe. I want the opportunity that you have. And if you look like me, he would say, you don't have that opportunity if you look like him. If you look like me, there's someone in the business like Kevin or you knew a cop. That's what you wanted to do. But someone looks like Kobe didn't know a cop. What he did it was a bad experience, either learned or direct. So that helps. Thank you. Me. Well, that's, that's it. I mean, and that brings us to relationships. That's why, you know, we talk about the issue of diverse forces. It has a lot to do with relationships. These kids have no relationships with police officers at a young age. Why are you expecting them to aspire to be something they know nothing about? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Thank you for your comments. I'm Ann. I'm a neighbor at Brown. Hi, Ann. Um, one of the reasons that a lot of our inner city youth cannot progress into the public <coughs> safety field is they don't swim. They can't swim. And there's a kind of a negative aspect about putting a bunch of 16-year-olds with 6-year-olds. So I was wondering in that gap time between November and February, if there could be an initiative with the local WISE, the Brown Pool, to have swimming lessons for our uh, youth that might be playing basketball during the better weather. Just well, an idea. And you as the neighbor, you have much more power than me, but I'd love for Brown. This is on video, right? I'd love. <laughs> I'd love for Brown to open its doors. I've been begging for universities, high schools, churches, open the doors and they will come. All right, and yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, hi, hi, my name is Alexis. How you doing, um, Alexis? So you, you were talking about, about the highway fiasco. And I know some of those groups have been pushing for like the Community Safety Act, yep. and I was just wondering what your thoughts on that um, act are. Right. So, the, the, and, I'm, and I'm calling it the highway fiasco, remember, from the standpoint of the, the media. All right. I, I'm a lot of friend, I'm friends with a lot of those guys that, you know, stand strong for that. And um, that's their beliefs, and that's, and that's okay with me. Um, the Community Safety Act, I have a lot, a lot of thoughts on it. I was wondering if you were coming to lunch after this because I'd love to talk to you in depth about that um, personally. Um, yeah, I have a, a lot to, to say about it, uh, a lot. <laughs> we could have our conversation. So if we could talk, if I think after this I'm going with some of the students yeah. to lunch. Yeah. So we'll sit next to each other. Yes. Sorry, I'm Richard Boucher. I'm teaching here at Watson. Um, you mentioned community basketball takes $250,000 no. a year? No, not at all. I mean, if it took but that, we wouldn't have it. It's, um, I said this, to, uh, the, the, the uh, cameras, oh, the camera. 250 grand. Because it strikes me this, I mean, even at, if you had 250 grand oh, give me 50 to grand. organize I can, I can do you know, right the, the basketball and the baseball and the, the different leagues and stuff, yeah. you could do that. Uh, 250 grand, yeah, I probably could run a year-round program uh, for Thousands and of you kids. can't get that from the state, or <laughs> look yeah. at this. Let me get on camera laughing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just strikes me as so much cheaper to do it this way than to buy all that and expensive that, equipment from. That may not uphold. Um, yeah. That may not be here next year. That may be obsolete. You know, these kids' lives will never. You know, they're gonna, the impact that we would have on these kids' lives would last forever. And I'm, that's what I've been trying to push for years. So you're, you're talking numbers. The Midnight League with 500. 500 players, probably 100 volunteers with, with the equipment, basketball, jerseys. I mean, with, with me out there begging in the streets, and I say me with my colleagues and friends, we, we ran that entire league. And remember, and we ended our league in the Dunkin' Donuts Center, by the way. You know, so it was a top-notch league. Um, we probably, it was probably 
about uh, fifty to sixty thousand dollars, and that was donations. That's donations that I'm still waiting for some, uh, you know, through referees and to pay referees and scorekeepers and things like that. So. I have a question. I don't know if it's uh, I'm Mary McElroy. My question is um, in a Project Night Vision. Um, I, Matt Toro and I work at the Public Defender's Office, so we kind of and are uh. in um, touch with a lot of people who are doing small things. And okay. I wonder, to me, one of the biggest challenges I think for a lot of these programs is coordinating um, funding, coordinating programs, coordinating people. Um, you know. Um, and I'm wondering if we, um, if there's any sort of central place that coordinates those things. In particular, you know, when you talk about basketball, um, we have a, a, a young part-time employee who runs his own inner city basketball program. A church gave him the keys. He goes there on a Tuesday night, and he, you know, at 5 o'clock or 5.30, he brings in a bunch of kids who are like 13, 14, 15 years old. I think he does another one in the evenings, outdoors, in the summer. He does it out of his own pocket. Is um, that in South County? No, oh. it's at, um, at Table of Christ Church on Elmwood Ave. That's oh, okay. the church. No, I just wonder if I so know. it's in it's in the neighborhood. So I'm just curious as to what effort there is to coordinate those things and what you know the rest of us can do to sort of help bring the coordination together. Well, so, uh, great question. And well, first of all, night vision is I would I would like to say it's on pause right now because I just me being exhausted. It's over. I didn't have these resources, and I will say to their defense. Brown University students have volunteered, uh, Johnson & Wales students, University of Rhode Island, CCRI, and uh, plenty of neighbors, doctors, lawyers, any, any, and you'd say public defenders, everyone has definitely came and pitched a hand because it's been in the news hundreds of times uh, and people would come and that's how I would get all the snacks. To this day I still get snacks from groups uh, that are still delivering stuff, Whole Foods, uh, different companies, uh, Reebok donated, uh, what was it? Twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of sneakers last year. Uh, people believe in what we're doing, but we really didn't have. We don't have any money to set up those type of in infrastructures and say, "All right, this is your job. You're here to answer the phone and do this." It was pretty much very informal. Email, stop by the program, so on and so forth. So for uh, all I could do is exchange contacts with you. That that's pretty much what I could do, and it just happens like that. There's really you know no no formal way to do it because of the lack of funding. We don't have We don't even have a building most of the time. Uh, right now, I'm out of Roger Williams University, who has lent us some office space and some, you know, uses their the computer computer lab and so on and so forth. But believe me, if, just imagine if we had Brown University let us use their gyms, Roger Williams University letting us use their computer labs, Johnson and Wales letting us use their cafeteria, PC lets us use their, uh, their their lacrosse fields. If that could happen, two to three hours a week. Uh, when I talk about silence, talking about the model for the country, we would be it. But it just can't, it just hasn't happened. The coordination just, you know, doesn't happen. And, and people keep trying to tell me it's a cost. And I, I don't think the cost of life uh, it weighs. I, I just don't think it equals uh, opening up your doors for two hours. I think we have time for one more. I have a question about your feelings more specifically on the, the cameras, to go back to that. Sure. And I'm wondering if you ever wonder about the potential negative implications of having cameras, not just the fact that it's a detraction from some of your solutions, but actually, you know, increasing surveillance could have a negative impact. Oh, yeah, I was trying my hardest not to go there, but <laughs> uh, definitely. I mean, this is what I'm hearing from the community alone, not just my personal feelings. I mean, the trust factor, it doesn't increase trust. The cameras don't increase trust because it's the same people that they didn't trust operating the cameras. So now, you know, I just want to know about, and this comes into the Community Safety Act for sure, how, who is going to disseminate this information that you went back to the office to review? Where's the community at in that? Where, who's helping out with that? Where, where's the board set up? Is it, where's the infrastructure set up to review this? And what's the time limit? You know, what's the, the last, I requested this from the mayor the other day, and he said he has 10 pages for me. That was two weeks ago. I would show it to you, but I just don't have it right now. I don't have it. But I'll get that to you if I get it. But I've asked all these questions already as soon as they came out on television and said that it's the save all. Um, I don't believe it. 
So it's, it's going to take some, some, some time for the community to trust that. We're still trying to mend the relationships with the human reaction. And now we're going to add a, you know, a deterrent. We're going to add something that's going to divide even more. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. And, and yes, it's a case by, it should be a city by city. And they're able to. They have the, I mean, in, in, a, in Rhode Island alone, how many police departments do we have, Colonel, in Rhode Island? How many? 39. 39. In Rhode Island alone, the 39 are, are not all on the same page, which they try. So we should have came to some type of consensus, and we should have talked about this before, which didn't happen, by the way. No one, no one spoke to, there was 10 people that had these body cameras. I still haven't seen one yet. And like I said, I'm in the streets every day. Kobe, thanks for a really inspiring, Thank Thank and you. I won't say the end of a conversation, but the beginning of a conversation. Thank you all for, for coming. Thank you.